Right, we're looking at some of the shorter topics now that you might get asked in youth culture. One of them is ethnicity in youth culture. Now, uh, there's not a lot from theoretical perspectives about ethnicity. Um, you know, the Marxists tend to be looking at, uh, well, the skinheads may work quite well actually for, for the Marxists because the skinheads are obviously needing to be white. So there is an element of ethnicity there, but for functionalism, they're saying youth is homogenous. For feminism, we're just focusing on gender. So uh, we haven't looked a lot at, at, at ethnicity, I suppose, in youth culture. There's not a lot on there. Um, so it's a shorter kind of topic uh, and it will work well for a short question about ethnicity that might just say explain the relationship between ethnicity and youth culture membership. But it will also work nicely um, in a bigger question to be evaluative. Uh, you know, it compares to class and gender very well. Uh, it also compares to ideas about resistance um, very well. You know, we've got a Marxist idea of resistance to capitalism, a feminist one of resistance to the patriarchy. Well, we have resistance in ethnicity as well. So, um, primarily, Hebdige would say, this is the first point, that um, youth culture develop as a form of resistance to dominant ideology. Now, when he, he talks about this, we mean the exclusion of migrants to the UK in the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. Um, you know, we are Windrush, where we invite people um, from the Caribbean to come to this country for work, because we are a population that's been impacted by um, deaths in the war. Um, but when migrants come over um, from any part of the world, but it, certainly from the Caribbean, they are met with high degree of racism from the, the, the population. Um, and what Hebdige would say is there's a good example of rasters forming as a response to this kind of racist dominant ideology that we see in the 40s, the 50s and the 60s, where migrants are excluded either because of colour bars, uh, or their inability to get housing in the areas that they want, their inability to get jobs in areas that they want. So there's a big problem. Now, we see Rasta emerging in popularity in the 1970s, so it's not actually the first initial migrants who start this culture of, of resistance to kind of, um, to grow and develop. It's, it's mainly the people who are um, the, the, you know, the sons and daughters of those um, of those migrants who've seen their parents experience racism and have grown up in this kind of um, society where, where this has happened to them. So we can see Rasta as a, as a good example of a group that formed to resist the dominant ideology, um, in that case a white ideology which is marginalising and discriminating against black people. Savannah Dan would support this idea because he would say that what you get is groups like Rasta forming to resist against kind of like a colonial oppression and this system of um, white dominance that has happened when England, for example, France also um, kind of went around the world and colonised these countries. And when we say colonise, we mean essentially take over a place, either um, sometimes by force, but maybe not always, but usually by force, take over a place and begin a process of exploiting that population, either their wealth or, or, or just the, you know, the people within that population. And they're doing that usually for monetary gain. So we would have gone to countries, forcefully uh, took charge of those countries, embedded our own systems and our own kind of leaders, and then started to exploit that country to gain wealth for Britain. Um, so Savannah Dan's kind of supporting of Hebdige here. We are seeing this opposition to kind of racism and these racist policies and ideas which lead to the formation of groups, as we put here, like Rastas. Okay, so resistance is key for Hebdige and Savannah Dan, and it is resistance to racism. So it goes nicely in a question on, um, you know, resistance. It, it nicely compares to feminism. It nicely compares to Marxism because yes, he's saying there's resistance, but it's resistance to something, um, something which is different. Um, we've also got here Hall, uh, who you should know by now, is moral panic. Police in the crisis could also be used when we're looking at ethnicity. And Gilroy, who I'll talk about in just a second. So Hall um, would say that essentially capitalism is is to do um, is to blame for the formation of um, youth cultures um, and for the treatment of certain youth cultures. We know in his study, Police in the Crisis, that it's young black lads who, te who are kind of vilified and blamed for the act of mugging. In the 1970s, 
Um, and Hall would suggest that actually the rates of mugging are not going up, but what it is, is a kind of media-driven moral panic to um, turn the young black youths into folk devils because of the, uh, or in order to rather, distract the general public from the crisis that's ensuing in, the, in capitalist society, the low wages, the unemployment, the urban decay, the riots that, you, that we're seeing. So young black lads become the scapegoats for the problems and as such their deviance is amplified because the numbers of stop and search goes up, the numbers of aggressive policing goes up, the numbers of aggressive encounters goes up and so does racism. And it culminates in um, you know, the formation maybe and popularity of groups like Rude Boy um, becoming more popular in that time. And also we see <coughs> race riots uh, in Brixton in the early 80s uh, taking place and, and this can all be kind of linked back to this, this potential moral panic. Gilroy as well, <coughs> who we'll cover in Crime and Deviance, um, Gilroy will say that, um, that, that essentially groups like Rasta form not just as a response to racism but also kind of capitalist oppression as well. So both Gilroy and Hall taking a kind of Marxist angle to this, that's saying it's not just race but it's also capitalism to blame. So uh, although similar to Hebdige and Savannah down in blaming racism, They've gone that extra step and said, but also it's because of class exploitation as well, uh, which is obviously why they've got a Marxist element from these writers. Um, some of the Marxists as well, um, like Miles, I think, would be um, critical of Gilroy by saying that, he, well, he's focusing too much on racism and really the big, the big struggle is still the social class struggle. Um, but, you know, so there's, there's still debate within the Marxist um, realm and within that field uh, 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 about this view. Um, we've got a couple more. Oh, Gilroy, um, actually when we talk about commercialization of black music, Gilroy does talk about um, the commercialization of maybe like reggae style um, and you know the kind of appropriation of symbols of resistance that the Rastas used like dreadlocks and certain colours um, and, and the way that they've kind of been taken in and almost incorporated by the mainstream. Gilroy actually argues that perhaps it's not um, not a segregating thing to have this kind of level of incorporation, that it could be quite good for society to, ha to have, you know, white working class people and um, black working class people uniting over music or uniting over style. Um, it's kind of maybe more of a unifying thing than a segregating thing. But there's some element that you could talk about, you know, consumerism here based off of that. Um, You've got Joe Hal uh, and Benny. Uh, Joe Hal will principally talk about Brasian. So we focused here uh, mainly on Rasta and Rude Boy and black <coughs> subcultures. Now we're going to look at um, Asian youth subcultures and the hybrid culture Joe Hal will call Brasian, a mixture of British and Asian. So the fusing together of um, two cultures. Now remember, hybridity is this notion of the bringing together of two things. So it's they're kind of like chicken tikka masala is an example of a hybrid dish. It's not a traditional curry, but it's um, it's got a British slant to it. I think Scotland they came up with it in. Uh, but it kind of fuses two things that we like together. And, and that's what Brasian is as a hybrid culture, the bringing together of British culture, but also um, these young British Asians not wanting to lose their traditional identity. So keeping some of their identity of their parents and grandparents, but also allowing them to kind of become part of a British culture as well. They basically don't want to give up and fully assimilate to being British. They want to keep some of their traditional heritage. Uh, you can see it in bands like Corner Shop and the song Bring Full of Asher, um, which is uh, written about Asher Bosley, who's a Bollywood singer. Uh, and within what was a very, very popular kind of Britpop song by a, 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 an Asian band from Wolverhampton, using the Britpop style, they use traditional um, kind of beats, rhythms, language um, from the Punjab region, um, kind of combine that. So it's a good example of operation. Uh, we see Bennett noting the popularity of things like Bangra and the way that that is kind of being used um, as now more of a mainstream <coughs> music kind of uh, style in the UK. Uh, and and the, that, that, that kind of exhibits operation as well. Um, so, um, that essentially is it for ethnicity and youth, okay? So we've got our focus on um, resistance to racism. We've also got here the impact of capitalism, the, the media, the impact of the oppression of, uh, of, of the working class, 
um, and racism. And then here we're looking at a hybrid culture existing because they don't want to fully assimilate to um, to kind of like a, a traditional British British culture. Um, a much shorter topic, but again, useful to compare to things like gender and class, um, and also nice um, in an essay about resistance to give a different perspective to just the you know resistance to capitalism, resistance to patriarchy, and all that Marxism and feminism will employ.